morning, everyone. Thank you. It's so great to be here. It, the sounds of everyone visiting before church is, is just amazing. It's, it's almost like it was before. It's great. Um, just a few reminders. Um, we can donate money for the Ukraine through P PWS and D through your envelopes. If you just designate the amount and, and where it's to go to P PWS and D. And also, we're having communion next week. We're really pleased to have, be able to have that again. And just a reminder that next week, masks are, are not mandatory. It's optional. And I'm sure every one of us is in a different place. So we're just all going to be respectful of each other and, and where we are. Um, today, we're welcoming Jeff Walthers, right here, to our church. Jeff told me he's very familiar with Ivy since he went to Central in Barrie, as a lot of us did. He played football and rugby, and he said was some of Ivy's finest, <laughs> and played broomball against the Ivy Rangers. Jeff was a broadcaster in radio and TV for 26 years at CKBB, CKVR-TV, and on B101 FM. He taught at Humber College in Toronto and is teaching at Georgian College for over 30 years now. Jeff and his wife attend Westminster Church in Barrie, and they have three children and six grandchildren. So we welcome Jeff to our church. Thank you, Thank you very much. Just going to get this where everybody's comfortable with it. Is that good? That's good. Very good. By listening to all those years, I must be 92. <laughs> Well, good morning. good morning. I'd like to thank uh, you for the invitation to be here this morning. It really is a treat to be back in, in Ivy. I almost didn't make it. Um, I started to sweat profusely filling up my car with gas on the way here. I felt physically ill when I had to pay for the gas. I think I might have car owner virus. I'm not sure, but... I was going to welcome you to a glorious Sunday morning, not necessarily because the sun's shining, because right now it isn't, but it's the first day of spring. It's the third Sunday of Lent, but the first day of spring, that just makes you feel better, doesn't it? And that's the truth. Look it up in your calendar. You can check the angle and the position of the sun in the sky when it comes out. But this is the vernal equinox, or spring equinox, which is when the amount of sunshine is approximately 12 hours. Now be assured that today, in downtown Ivy, Ontario, it is spring. That's the truth. My truth, your truth, the truth. Today we're going to look at the truth and our purpose in God's plan. In the book of Psalms, chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, we read this, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent, who may live on your holy mountain, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. As we gather this morning, may we be grateful for God's words and teachings that bring light and direction to our lives. And praise Jesus, who through God's Holy Spirit brings us peace, forgiveness, and love. Please refer to your bulletins as we're going to join in a responsive reading, uh, recognizing and celebrating the third Sunday of Lent together. I will begin with the one part, and if you'd all join me in the response. During Lent, God hears the desires of our hearts and chooses what is best for us. God draws us into a deeper relationship, offering us compassion, mercy, and insight. God hears and responds to our plans when they honor God's purposes for creation. While we don't always recognize it, sometimes our dreams can be distorted, harmful, and not consistent with God's principles. 
we praise God for when God says yes and for when God says no. Let us pray together. All-knowing God, you see and understand all things. You walk with us on the journey to Christian maturity, and we know that you provide us guidance and wisdom. Help us to follow your ways. Make us patient when you correct us. Forgive us when we resist your newness, and encourage us when we seek new ways of being. Let our lives conform to the pattern of the life of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. For our opening prayer this morning, please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning as your people, your church. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for the many blessings that we have enjoyed and do enjoy and yet will see. We take so much for granted, Father. The food on our tables, the sun in the sky, the doctors and nurses in hospitals, the Bible in our hands, each breath we take, this building where we can again gather to worship as a church family with a little more freedom from a pandemic that so powerfully has reminded us how weak and vulnerable we really are. But you, Lord, are God, our Creator, our Father, and friend. You sent your Son, Jesus, who called us friends and brothers and sisters to show us your light and love, a limitless love. And you asked us to simply love you and love one another. That's not much to ask from one who so willingly exchanged his holy crown for a crown of thorns. His place by your side for a crude manger in a stable. Who would leave the protection of legions of angels to live amid sinners, hate, jealousy, greed, suspicion. And exchange his very life for those sinners, for us. Forgive us when we take salvation for granted, Lord. Through your Holy Spirit, Lord, heal us and help us. Give us the weak and vulnerable, unfailing faith and the blessed assurance of your hope and your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise selection. First one this morning. I'm going to turn you over to Debbie, another central redskin turned phoenix. <laughs> this is uh, hymn number 769 in your hymn books. I'm sorry, number 358 in your hymn books, and it's There is a Redeemer. Thank you, oh my father. 
Thank you. Be seated. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Philippians. And if you'd like to join me in chapter 2, we'll read verses 1 through 13. Philippians 2, verses 1 to 13. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my love by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross." Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So the Presbyterian preacher and his wife decided to get a new dog. And they knew that the dog had to be a Presbyterian. So they went to kennel after kennel and they explained their need. And finally they found a kennel where the owner assured them that he had just the dog that they wanted. He brought the dog to meet the pastor and his wife and he commanded, fetch the Bible. The dog bounded over to a bookshelf, scrutinized the books, located a Bible, brought it to the owner, and dropped it at his feet. Now find Psalm 23, he told the dog. The dog dropped the Bible to the floor, showing amazing dexterity with his paws, leafed through it, found the correct passage, and pointed to it with his paw. The pastor and his wife were pretty impressed. They bought the dog. And that evening, a group of church members came over and the pastor and his wife decided to show off the dog. They asked him to locate some Bible verses, and he found them all. Visitors were pretty impressed, but one guy said, can he do regular dog tricks? The pastor said, well, I haven't actually tried that yet. He pointed his finger at the dog, and he said, heal. The pastor saw the dog immediately jump up on a chair, and he placed one paw on the pastor's forehead and began to howl to heaven. The pastor looked at his wife and said, Oh no, he's a Pentecostal. <laughs> <laughs> Truth is, the dog was a Labrador retriever. Have you ever heard that expression, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction? Well, sometimes we have to be very careful because it turns out that what we think to be the truth can actually be fiction. Right and wrong, my truth, your truth, their truth. What is the truth? What's your favorite song from this list? Let's see. White Christmas. Sweet Caroline. Yesterday. How about Amazing Grace? or itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. Whichever one you chose is the one you think is the best of those songs on that list. It's your favorite, it's your preference. It does not mean that when somebody else picks a different song as their favorite, that they're wrong. It's just one that you prefer. You may love to eat pickled eggs, just because 99% of the rest of the world thinks you're wrong, you're not. It's something you might prefer to eat. 
just realize that those other people aren't wrong either and they have good reason to prefer not to be in the same room as you later on. Now, how many marbles are in this jar? You can estimate, you can assume, you can guess, you can opine all you like. But regardless of your opinion, the truth is there are 56 marbles in the jar. They've been counted very carefully before going into the jar, 56. That's a fact, that's the truth. You may prefer to believe, or you and the person next to you might actually have come to an agreement that there were 36 or 106. But the truth is, there are 56. Don't believe me? <laughs> Count them. Oh. I didn't want to give the caretaker a heart attack. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Some people may prefer to think that there are many ways to get into heaven. It's their preference to think that there are other truths. John Lennon saying, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. Sure, it's easy to imagine. Lots of people prefer to believe that. Is it true? I can tell you there's only one way to find out, and except for one person so far, that trip is a one-way ticket. In fact, I once heard that the people who wrote Stairway to Heaven and Highway to Hell must have had some idea of expected traffic volumes. Some prefer to believe that the earth is flat, that aliens built the pyramids, and that if we vote for so-and-so, they'll finally balance the budget. The truth is, there is only one truth. And whether you choose to accept the truth can make a very big difference in your life. Because somebody's popular or powerful doesn't make everything they say true. The truth is, Today we're going to look at something which we all need to seriously consider. It's an important decision that we have to make. Yes or no? True or false? There's only one right answer. What is the right answer to this question? Yes or no? True or false? Do we actually have a purpose? The Bible says very clearly that the answer is yes. True. You and I have a purpose. We are not random accidents. We didn't just happen. We're here for a reason. God has a purpose for each and every one of us. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. I don't remember where I first saw this article, but I saved it, and I thank the author for their contribution to this message. This just in, scientists have discovered a device that runs on solar energy to remove carbon from the air and turn it into beautiful, strong, sustainable building material. It's called a tree. <laughs> a tree has purpose, many purposes actually. First and foremost, trees literally remove a dangerous gas called carbon dioxide from the air and turn it into oxygen, which we must have to breathe. Trees create shade and shelter for birds and animals and insects and us. Trees provide combustible wood we use to heat homes, cook foods. Trees have extensive networks of roots that hold the soil and prevent erosion. The bark and leaves of trees contain medicinal miracles. The oak tree, the silver birch, junipers, elderberry trees, many more contain strong elements to fight cold, flu, reduce kidney stones, and to fight pain. Of course, the berries, acorns, and fruit of many trees contain delicious, healthy foods, and the sap of various trees is used to create syrup and sweet treats. 
And the leaves of the trees can change color to create a rainbow beauty in the fall. They come in many shapes, sizes, and designs. And there's even one country which selected a leaf to be its national symbol for all the world to see. God created trees for a purpose. And he created you and I for a purpose. The word purpose comes from an old Anglo-French verb meaning to propose. When a man proposes marriage to a woman, he is saying, it is my purpose to spend my life with you. Nobody else, just you. Anything that conflicts with one's purpose in life is not even considered or shouldn't be. When the young boy Daniel was taken as a captive to Babylon, the Bible tells us that he purposed in his heart not to defile himself in that pagan land. That meant he would not eat food sacrificed to pagan gods, so he proposed to the one in charge an alternative to the diet he had been offered. He didn't have to wonder, what should I do? He made that decision before God many years earlier. His purpose was to live a life of purity and obedience to his God as an example to all others. And that powerful purpose would guide Daniel through a night in the lion's den, an amazing life of service to God. Daniel realized this truth. Your career is what you're paid for. Your calling that's what you're made for. Evangelical theologian, Presbyterian pastor, Francis Schaeffer once spoke of the essential importance of purpose when he wrote, man forgets his purpose and thus he forgets who he is and what life means. Most of us don't know much about the life of John Erickson, but I can tell you that he was an Olympic wrestler who competed for the United States in 1932 and was a member of the U.S. National Wrestling Hall of Fame. Now that's pretty cool. To be among the best in the world at anything takes years of hard work and training. I really don't know what John's life purpose was. Maybe wrestling in the Olympics. Or, or so he thought. But as cool as that might have been, something else would happen as a result of his life. And it would truly be world-changing for many. You see, he married a young lady named Lindy. They had four daughters. And one of them would be named after him. Yes, John had a daughter named Johnny. J-O-N-I. Johnny. He would bring up his family around athleticism and faith in God. In her life story, Johnny tells about campfires with her family, sing-alongs and stories from the Bible. And she recalls making a decision for Christ at a summer camp as a young teen. The girl would lead, a, a, lead an active life, riding horses, hiking, playing tennis, swimming, but her Christian life was not exactly vibrant. She recalls knowing that she had said yes to faith in Jesus, but she said something was missing, perhaps a purpose. She says she prayed for God to do something to shake her up and put her on a path. She wrote in the discovery of his purpose when we trust in him, but I guarantee you she never expected what was about to happen to her. One day in 1967, when she was just 17 years old, Everything would change for her, her dad, her family, her life. Johnny went swimming. She dove into Chesapeake Bay, struck her head on the bottom. The impact broke her neck, severed her spinal cord, and she instantly became a tetraplegic, totally paralyzed from the shoulders down. Now, whatever dreams or thoughts she previously had for her life and future were as shattered as the vertebrae in her back. During her two years of rehabilitation, according to her autobiography, Johnny, she experienced anger, depression, suicidal thoughts, and religious doubts. Hard times can make it difficult to see God's purpose, especially when we're feeling pain and grief. But God works through all situations to fulfill his purpose. Listen to this, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. 
When Johnny's dreams were shattered, God's purpose in her life was revealed. Her life was valuable because it was valuable to God. During occupational therapy, she learned to paint with a brush between her teeth and began selling her artwork. She also learned to write this way, though now she uses voice recognition software, which is a good thing because to date she's written over 40 books. Johnny, her 1976 bestseller, Johnny, the unforgettable story of a young woman's struggle against quadriplegia and depression, has been distributed in multiple languages and was made into a 1979 feature film starring Johnny herself. By the way, she also recorded several musical albums, starred in an autobiographical movie of her life, is an advocate for people with disability, and began a five-minute daily radio program, Johnny and Friends Radio, that can be heard on over a thousand broadcast outlets across the U.S. She has a TV program viewed by millions. Other Johnny and Friends programs include Family Retreats, which is a camp retreat experience for families affected by disability. Wounded Warrior Getaways, which offer a similar experience for families of wounded veterans. Wheels for the World, which collects manual wheelchairs and other mobility devices to be refurbished by volunteers in prison restoration shops. Shipped overseas, where the wheelchairs are fitted by physical therapists for people in developing nations who would never otherwise be able to get that help. Not bad for a woman nearly totally paralyzed for 55 years. Pastor Matthew Rattan of Westminster Presbyterian Church in Barrie gave us this capsule of wisdom. Trials can be teachers and trainers. Indeed, God's promises and, perfect, uh, and purposes are perfect, even though we aren't. We have our own ideas, doubts, and fears that can keep us from living out His purposes. However, by consistently reading and studying his word, our faith will become stronger each day. And in the process, we'll begin to understand God's purpose in our life. Perhaps sometimes we don't even know it. He just makes it happen. Apparently, John and Lindy Erickson once purposed to raise their four daughters in the knowledge of God. Do you think they initially realized the impact that their faithfulness in pursuing that purpose would have on the life of their children and on the incredible life of Johnny and every life that she would touch? In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 5, you can read this. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. We might prefer to think we know everything, but God knows that we cannot know or even comprehend many things. And God has done his work through purposeful people all through history. Sometimes, through our seemingly simple acts of faith, like raising children to know and love God's wisdom, he can work absolute miracles. If we are faithful, he will work through us. Listen to what Jesus says, Matthew 17, 20. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall move, and nothing shall be impossible for you. He used a grain of mustard seed, it's such a tiny thing, as an example of the immense, unfathomable power of God. Like the spark that starts a roaring inferno, the small stone in David's slingshot that fell to giant. The five loaves and two fishes that fed 5,000. Like the one man, Jesus, who would change all of man's history and destiny. Even a seemingly insignificant faith in God can move mountains. Many of us are full of anxiety, and we should be, if there is no God, no Bible, no Jesus. No Holy Spirit, no heaven, no hope. But if you have faith that there is a God, a Savior, a Holy Spirit, a Bible, an eternal city, and a sure and certain hope, we have all those things as part of our salvation. God loves us perfectly, and perfect love casts out fear. Do you worry? Instead of worrying, 
Try worshiping. A song of praise, a little prayer does so much to drive out the worries and woes of life. Focus on God. Focus on purpose, not problems. UCLA won 10 NCAA basketball titles under coach John Wooden, and he said this, it's what you know after you know it all that counts. Saul was a very learned man. He studied under the best and he was rising up the ranks of the Jerusalem temple. He knew the Jewish scriptures. He thought that he would do God a favor. He purposed himself to stamp out Christianity in the years following the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Talk about prophecy. Jesus told his disciples in John 16 too, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's doing God a favor. But Saul met Christ on the road to Damascus, and Saul became Paul, the, uh, the apostle. He reorganized his priorities. He completely repurposed his life. In Philippians 3, he revealed what this single purpose would be. But one thing I do, I press toward the goal of God's call in Christ Jesus. He no doubt had many goals, be faithful, be disciplined, be generous, be loving. But each of these goals all served his one consuming purpose, as he says, to press toward God in Christ. Paul's purpose ordered his life. It was the standard by which everything else was measured. Paul's purpose should be the purpose of every one of us. The Reverend George Ellis wrote, God has invested in you. You are his masterpiece, his prized possession. But in order to be what God intended for us to be, there are some things that we must go through to get there, and what we go through may not always be pleasant. Joseph, in the book of Genesis, was born for a purpose. He went from being hated by his own brothers who threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery, to being falsely accused of sexual assault and thrown in prison. He went from being thrown in a pit to being 2IC, second in command in the kingdom of Egypt. Satan can't kill purpose. He tried it in Exodus when Pharaoh had all the male children killed. But God had a purpose for Moses to set his people free from the bondage of Egypt. Satan tried again when Herod had all of the children of Bethlehem two years old and younger killed. But Matthew tells us God had a purpose for the baby Jesus to set his people free from the bondage of sin. God has a plan, and he has two purposes in that plan, our good and his glory. Ultimately, he will make us like Jesus. God gave us a destiny. Walk in your purpose, end quote. Now think of this as a small and almost unseeable act of testimony, an act of faith the size of a mustard seed. Around 1900, a sobbing little girl stood near a small church from which she'd just been turned away because it was too crowded. I can't go to Sunday school, she sobbed to the pastor as he walked by her. Seeing her dirty, shabby, unkempt appearance, the pastor guessed the real reason why she might have been turned away. He took her by the hand, he took her back inside, and found her a place in a Sunday school class. The child was so happy that they found room for her, she went to bed that night thinking of the children who had no place to worship Jesus. Some two years later, this child lay dead in one of those poor tenement buildings nearby, and her parents called for the kind-hearted pastor who had befriended their daughter to handle those final arrangements. As her poor little body was being moved, a worn and crumpled purse was found, which seemed to have been rummaged from a trash can somewhere. Inside, they found 57 cents and a note scribbled, which read, this is to help build the little church bigger so more children can go to Sunday school. For two years, 
she'd saved this love offering of 57 cents. When the pastor tearfully read that note, he knew instantly what he had to do. He carried it and the crack red pocketbook to the pulpit. He told his parishioners the story of the little girl's unselfish love and devotion. He challenged his deacons to get busy and raise enough money for a larger building. And here's where that little tiny mustard seed moves the mountain. A newspaper learned of the story and published it. It was read by a realtor who offered them a parcel of land worth many thousands, but when told that the church could never pay so much, he agreed to sell it for 57 cents. Moved by what they saw happening with the land, church members made huge donations and checks came in from far and wide as people heard the story, and they started building. Within five years, that little girl's gift, 57 cents, had increased to $250,000 in value, a huge sum of money in the early 20th century. Her unselfish love had paid a miraculous dividend. If you've ever been in the city of Philadelphia, look up Temple Baptist Church. You heard of it? It has a seating capacity of 3,300 and came to include Temple University, where hundreds of students are trained and educated. Then have a look at Good Samaritan Hospital and at a Sunday school building which houses hundreds of Sunday schoolers. No child in the area will ever again be left outside because there's no room in Sunday school. In one of the rooms of this building is a picture of the sweet little girl whose 57 cents so sacrificially saved made remarkable history. Alongside it, a portrait of her kind pastor, Dr. Russell Conwell, the author of the book, Acres of Diamonds. A true story, which clearly demonstrates what God can do with a kind act by a pastor, 57 cents, and a little girl's faithful testimony the size of a grain of mustard seed. How beautiful is that? Somehow that little girl knew that she and other children have a place in God's plan. She knew she had a purpose to do something, anything, however small, to make sure that other young kids would have a chance to learn about her Jesus. The late great evangelist Billy Graham once said, God's business now is to mold you into the image of Christ so that you will love like he loves, have peace like he has, joy like he has, gentleness like he has. You and I have a purpose, to love God and love one another, to reflect the character of Jesus and show the world that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. We are going to go to hymn number 769 in the Book of Praise to sing together, Lord of Light. Deb? And we'll just sing verses 1, 2, and 4. 1, 2, and 4. Thank you. 1, 2, and 4. No. 
Prayers of the people. Just bow your heads with me. Father God, we praise you and honor you this morning in song and service. We believe that nothing is impossible and that you hold our world in your hands. We thank you that we can gather and freely worship the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the one who gives us hope and purpose. We pray for continued protection and peace in this land. May we continue to wield the weapon of love, loving you and loving one another, even loving our enemies. That's what Jesus did when he forgave his captors, executioners, and each one of us. We bow our heads now in humility and ask that you, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. There are some among us who need your healing touch today, Lord. There are some who cannot be here due to pain, fatigue, handicap. There are some who did not choose to worship and fellowship with others because things get in the way. Stretch out your hand and let them feel the healing of body and spirit, Father. We've gone through a trying two years of COVID. Separation, sickness, even death has visited many. Heal our spirits and minds, Lord. Remind us of your promise in John 16:33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world there will be suffering, but I have overcome the world. We remember also the promise that there will come a day when there will be no mourning, no crying, no pain anymore, for these things will pass away. We thank you for this assurance and your invitation to each of us to share in your great and glorious eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray that instead of bombs and missiles, mercy and peace may rain down on Ukraine. Give these your people compassion, comfort, and care. We thank you for the many Christian organizations and individuals who have hurried to help the hungry, the injured, and deliver the assurance that our God is mighty to save. May we all do our part to support and pray for these helpless and desperate souls. Remind us that there but for the grace of God go we. Not just Ukraine, Lord, but in any land where hatred, terror, and godlessness reigns, may you be present. May you be the light in those dark places. Make our leaders wise. Give us courage and confidence to speak up and rebuke wrongful deeds and resist foolish teaching. Speak to each of us and encourage us to go, therefore, into our corner of the world to speak of hope and live out Jesus' message, to keep the darkness back and let the message spread light, love, hope. Let your wisdom and light shine through us for others to see and to replace tears and fears with glorious hope and strength in you, Lord. Give us a sense of purpose so whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it all for the glory of God. May we be in Christ. Amen. Final praise selection this morning is from the uh, Ivy Songbook. It's number 206, it's Shout to the Lord.
shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Again, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to be with you uh, this morning. So a, a very special thanks to Debbie and Myrna. I really appreciate you helping me navigate the service this morning. And to each of you here in this sanctuary or watching from home, peace be with you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>